I guess uh, everybody knows I'm a, uh, a cave diver. I've been cave diving for an awful long time. In fact, 46, 47 years I've been cave diving. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, well, a lot of you are thinking, this man has had a very charmed life. And I'm thinking to myself, perhaps I have had a charmed life, but now I think I know exactly what to do and what not to do. But anyway, I'm not going to get in, into any depths of stuff like that. But basically, when I joined South Wales Caving Club in my teenage years, I started meeting cave divers, and wow, the stories, the stories were so epic, so gripping. People passing sumps, finding miles of new cave, descending pitches, going through squeezes, digging through boulder chokes that collapsed upon them. It was epic stuff. And I knew at that point I had to write a story. So the story is, and this is the blatant bit of advertising, so you lot out there, take advantage of the fact that this man has, is offering, you know, like postage free on UK postals. This is, that's the blatant advertising on this book. So the first edition was up there, as you can see, uh, you can see top left. 1980, and the most recent version, which is a complete and utter rewrite in 2017, this is the book that will do justice to the story of cave diving, not just in Britain, but worldwide. But British explorers are right there, right at the very forefront of activities today. Now, I've been around a long time, but not quite that long. As you can imagine, you know, Wales, Danarog of 1912, this is where it all kicked off in, in our area. But as you've heard from other speakers, caving has been undertaken for many hundreds of years prior to that. But cave diving is the ultimate exploration of all time. You know, to be a cave diver in Britain, you have to embrace all the, the facets of caving and then take them all that one step further. So... Cave diving depends upon equipment. The earliest equipment available was standard equipment, which you see here in 1935 being used at Wookie Hole. And, and this technique, this approach to exploration, required that air be pumped down from the surfaces along those tubes you see snaking across the floor. And obviously then the diver is restrained, constrained by the length of pipe and the, the, the physical difficulties of trying to hoik that around. So it was impractical. Wookie Hole was the only place where this technique really enjoyed any success. And Balcom and, and the first lady of British cave diving, Penelope Powell, went in 70 meters. So what do cavers proper do? They scale it down so that in 1936, they make this first successful passing of Swildon Sump 1. Again, the same sort of approach. The guy in the background there manning the little stirrup pump is supplying the diver, Jack Shepard, with a hose pipe, a normal garden hose pipe worth of air, so that the diver had to synchronize his breathing to the downstroke of the guy on the pump. It's all told in much more interesting uh, language in the book. Okay, so it required basically for effective cave diving that the, the diver sever their surface links, well, as many of them as they possibly could. So as a result of the Second World War, rebreather diving equipment became available. And you see the guys in this picture here in Wookie Hole, as you see there, 1949, in the late 1940s then, this was the common approach. But only a very few people were ever adopting this. So basically, the diver was supplied with pure oxygen. Uh, this was exhaled into a breathing bag. The exhalations went through a canister of, of carbon dioxide absorbent. Uh, and then the purified gas would be recirculated, uh, and so the, the duration of the, of the gas supply was greatly extended. This technique, this, uh, this approach to cave diving, very effective, but the diver was limited to depths less than 10 meters due to the nature of the fact that oxygen below 10 meters is toxic. Okay, so in South Wales, in 1960, as this picture shows, this was the end, really, of the oxygen rebreather era, the old oxygen rebreather era. You can see there, by this stage, some divers are wearing lead-weighted boots, the guy on the right. The diver on the left, Charles George, is operating with fins. 
But in 1961, everything was to change. Mike Boone, who you've all heard of this weekend, from the Watford Underwater Club, introduced scuba diving into cave diving. And the guy in the center here, the notorious Ken Pierce, is shown here on a photograph in the, in the Gouffre Berger, where he achieved a, a depth on his second expedition of 1135 meters. And uh, Pierce then was diving on these tiny little cylinders, which you see on the right and on the left, uh, and in both of these pictures, left and right, th that's myself in 75 on the right and on one of my very first, my fifth cave dive on the left one in OFD. So the, the gear in those days, as um, Sid was saying much earlier on, Christ, alive, the gear was primitive. It was very, very basic. And uh, yeah, sometimes it didn't work. Anyway, in the 1970s, people like Jeff Yeadon, seen here at Kell Head, started making much longer cave dives uh, and using more cylinders to achieve the greater durations. And here, again, same time period, the mid-1970s, at Keld Head, you see Jeff Eden sitting down on the bank, Oliver Statham in the blue suit. The blue suit was a dry suit, a constant uh, volume dry suit, which enabled divers wearing heavy cylinders to neutralize or to uh, just to maintain a nice, even position floating through the water. Not too light so they floated, not too heavy with all these cylinders on so as to have to crawl along the cave floor. So these guys made massive dives, as, as Sid presented and told us about earlier this morning. Uh, and in fact, this ended up as a world record traverse from Kingsdale Master Cave to Keld Head in 1979. Meanwhile, down south... I'd set my sights on Wookiee Hole, and in 1977 and 1982 achieved what was then British cave diving depth records, and using, as you see on my, on my left arm there, the first underwater diving computer ever used in the British Isles. So it was really useful. And here I am making surface decompression, breathing pure oxygen on the surface so as to strip out residual nitrogen uh, from the body. Uh, and on that particular expedition in 1982, myself and my two loyal supporters, Rob Palmer and Rob Parker, had to camp inside the cave because physiology and physiologists of the day said, you can't come back out after making a, a 60 meter depth dive at the end of Wookiee Hole. You've got to camp in the cave. Well, it was all very successful. But on that trip then, I thought, well, I've done enough at Wookiee Hole. But Rob Parker clearly thought, hmm, I bet I can go further than that. So Rob was a, was a great guy. He took himself off to Florida, trained under the likes of, uh, well, the leading Floridian divers of the day, and came back with a special gas mix, trimix. In other words, he was introducing now helium into the breathing supply, helium to dilute the effects of, of nitrogen, reduce the narcosis, which means you could operate with a much clearer head at greater depths. So Rob reached, as you see, uh, up there, 68 meters depth. Uh, and then later on, as you see on the, on the caption on the right-hand side there, in 2004-2005, Rick and John Valanthan progressed on down using this gas mix, but on uh, rebreathers. But we'll come back to that in a little while, to reach 90 meters depth. All right, so I'm, I'm jumping around a little bit here to, to sh give you an idea of the British contribution in the world of cave diving. So in the Bahamas, uh, on Andros Island in 1981 and 1982, I was very privileged to be at the right point at the right time to make uh, world record undersea cave diving penetrations, achieving on the second dive in 82 a penetration of 1.1 kilometers. So this is a little bit of a shot of the terrain. Now, any divers in the audience, there must be one or two here, will look at this and think, Christ, look at that dire, atrocious technique. Rob's virtually vertical in the water. Because we had no idea, basically, of, of good technique, Floridian technique. We were just applying good old British enthusiasm, get in there, push on, find the cave. All right, moving back to, to mainland Britain. 
In the 1980s, I've got up there, Ireland. In the 1980s, wow. In the late 70s and the, and, and the 80s, miles of cave. Many kilometers of cave were found by diving in, in Ireland. And then in 1984, just all the cavers know what happened at Darren Keeley in, in 1984. We broke through and found many, many kilometers of, of cave there, dry cave. So I am first and foremost a caver, but when needs arise, then I'm also then a cave diver. And that culminated the, the, the uh, Darren Keeley exploration in the traverse, the first complete traverse of, of Langatic Mountain, the longest and the deepest underwater, and longest and deepest cave in traverse in the British Isles at the time. So, the water's chilly and cold. It's not so everywhere else, as, as people are well aware. But to do lo ever longer dives, doesn't matter where, you need more gas. You need more gas. So, what is the approach? Well, you just clip on an extra cylinder. But even the Irish struggle in this respect, as Tim will know full well. You know, a, a bottle of Guinness will take you so far, but eventually you realize you need to reappraise your approach to diving altogether. So the future didn't lay or doesn't lay lie with taking more and more cylinders. You have to actually use rebreathers. And this is where the new age, and Rick will tell us far more about this than I can competently tell you, because Rick has really specialized in it. On the next talk, Rick will tell us all about this. But he passed someone in the, in the emergence de Rissel, down in the Lot region, southern France, in, in 1998, on open circuit. Uh, and here he is, a, a few years later, on his rebreather. New Age Rebreather Technology. You're the British guys who are at the cutting edge of cave diving at this present point in time. So from left to right, you can read for yourself who they are. The guy on the right, René Huben, is, is Dutch, but you know, like he's, a, he's a great guy. He, he, well, I could almost make him an adopted Welshman. He's really good. So, but you can see there, it doesn't, everything doesn't always go well. This was taken, I, I put it on the Pothu Athul team, because Pothu Athul is wor the world record uh, penetration at this pen present point in time has been established by these guys. And I'm going to show you a short video in a moment of what it's like. But before uh, that video is shown, take a look at Jason Mallinson's diving equipment here. My God. Now, this is a rebreather on Jason's back. I probably physically couldn't stand up supporting all that weight. He's a phenomenally uh, ferocious, uh, determined character, Jason. And he is very, a very capable engineer, capable of building his equipment to allow him to make a world record uh, dives such as he established in 2010. So here's a picture of, of Rick Stanton in Pothu some two, diving beneath some underwater habitats, places where the divers can come back to after long underwater penetrations. And if things are not going right, surface up into little mini air bells and, yeah, possibly escape uh, a, a, a very serious predicament. Right, so this, now if I can... Um, click somewhere on the screen, I can give you a flavor of the nature of the, of the diving that these guys are doing. John has a lot of gear to prep. The standing blue container <coughs> is his dry tube, containing a full set of camping equipment and everything else necessary to survive a couple of nights beyond some two. Sitting on top of the dry tube is an exploration line rail and completing this odd-looking assemblage will be another scooter. A restriction at the cave entrance discharges a strong current, more than a little water for such a heavily equipped diver. Inside, the flow is barely noticeable, and John is quickly underway. As everyone knows, this is a place for the utmost care. This is all life support equipment, and any damage could be critical.
There are so many clips, hoses, cables and cords, and only the diver understands his rig. Nothing distracts Jason, and both Rob and I stand by in awe. hours to follow, we learn just how serious their days underground are. Beyond some three, over nine kilometres diving from home, Jason and John changed into wetsuits to transport diving equipment to some four. This involved three separate carries, each way to scale a lengthy set of cascades and dangerously sharp rock. Some four was easy and shallow, but beyond came another extremely hazardous streamway. The risk of injury or damage to their dry suits was now the overriding concern. They were forced to turn back. Quite enough of that. I think that's what I said every year. <laughs> So a really serious stuff. The amount, the volume of gear that they're carrying, and it's every, it's like a chain. Every, any chain is only as good as the weakest link. And there are just so many links involved in the equipment that they are using. But people like Rick have been to the end of this particular cave here, Cocklebiddy in the Nellabore of Australia, six kilometers in. Rick has been to the bittermost end of that cave. Uh, and in exploring tunnels like this, using scooters and all the rest of it. Now, meanwhile, I, I've been very, very fortunate to be in the right time and be invited by Andy, uh, Evis, and, and, and people to, to participate uh, on the first full-blown expedition into China, for example. Uh, and I was lucky in, in 1985 to make the first cave dive, first scuba cave dive in the whole of China, and the, in the year before on, in Mulu. So I've been very, very fortunate in, in my time of cave diving. So much so that the Chinese invited me in 2013 to come and open their first cave diving center in Duan, which is sort of uh, in, in the southern section of, of China. This very, very deep place, the, the Duan cave systems down in the south are deep, very, very deep, and these have now been some of these have been explored to 213 meters depth. Okay, so Rick has been involved in very, very deep explorations as well across Europe, and he'll tell us more about this sort of uh, nature of diving in, in a bit. Meanwhile, I have gone to uh, explore many, many kilometers of cave now in New Zealand. <laughs> and uh, this particular place is in, the, in Golden Bay at the southern end of, of, nor of uh, the northern end of Southern Ireland. And I'm just going to finish here by saying this to me is what cave diving is about. This fabulous cave, this section of cave was called Avalon in the old cottage, Totara cave system. And this is what it's all about. This is cave diving at its very best. Once clear of the silt, the dive is easy and shallow. On the first operation, I quickly pass the sump and explore an ongoing streamway for 400 meters. The passage ends at another sump. It's an extremely intimidating place, but the potential rewards are immense. This next operation, I intend to try and video. I laid 200 meters of line into the ongoing cave and disappointed at the limited progress, returned to look for side passages. I can't believe my luck when I make a six meter ascent to find a large old fossil passage. I'm lost for words as I carefully tiptoe between increasingly beautiful arrays of formations. The 
This is utterly breathtaking. I have been fortunate and privileged to discover some fantastic places over the years, but this must rank amongst the very best. I name the chamber Avalon, one of the most beautiful caverns in the world. hours in the chamber before I pack away the equipment and dive out. The discovery of Avalon is every cave diver's dream, but as I talk the day through with my friends, it is clear that far more lies waiting to be explored. So, so I'd just like to say I've been so privileged to meet the, the pioneers of all time, Graham Balcom, the, the, the godfather of British cave diving. I've, I've been privileged to meet Norbert Castoret himself in the south of France. What a privilege that is. And uh, well, the future, what is the real future? Well, this is a fully autonomous robot, first put to use in 2016. So you can ask yourself now, are cave divers becoming obsolete? Well the robots might go there, but they can't get out of the water at the other end. And so, you know, there'll always be a place for humans to follow behind and explore those caves. So it's a fabulous world. There's fabulous recreational diving out there. And it is nowhere near as, dang as dangerous uh, uh, a pastime today as it was when I started out in 1970-71. We know how to stay safe these days. You stay within the limits, you have fabulous diving. So get this book and read all about it properly. Christmas present, there you go. Boom. Complete rewrite. Thank you very much, everyone. Well done, sir.